Question number one, Councillor Osborne. Question number one to the leader, please. Um, I thank Councillor Osborne for his question. And before I answer it, may I welcome you, Mr. Mayor, to your new role and the start of your year. Um, Councillor Osborne asks an interesting question, and uh, I'd ask one to him in return, is to say which of the savings in Part A of this uh, answer are the ones that his party would support, and if they didn't support them, which ones, would, uh, what ways would they uh, find to replace the saving they do not support? Because it's all very well asking for this information, which they would have got anyway had they read their papers, to then simply say, well, uh, this is the basis of a supplementary saying how, how awful it is. Because the responsibility of power, which is heavy, is that we make decisions which uh, re reflect the requirements of this council at the same time protecting as many vulnerable people as possible. But the responsibility of position is to say that if they don't agree with us, what would they do instead? Supplementary? Councillor Osborne. Um, can I um, thank the leader for his answer? And um, note that in part of his answer, he has referred to the um, joint arrangements with Croydon Council um, on the future of our libraries. Um, now, I understand that um, he may want to supply information in his answer to me uh, later on. He may not have it to hand this evening because some information has emerged during the course of today. Um, so can I ask him, on the basis of that information, uh, uh, an allegation circulating that Croydon Council con uh, conducted a co consultation exercise on this process. They kept the results of the consultation exercise secret for a long period. Um, and now that the results have come out, the assertion is uh, that they distorted the results of that consultation exercise to support their actions. Um, I'm not sure whether the allegations are true or false, but I wonder if the uh, leader of the council can shed any light on it for us. It's an interesting supplementary. Uh, belies Councillor Osborne's uh, bid for power of opposition leader of Croydon Council. Um, I can't answer that question. It's a question for Councillor Fisher to answer. But what I can say is that we have a procurement process which is widely admired, and it is our intention that we will follow our procurement process to the letter and the spirit. The decision we took to procure um, other providers for our library services was one that we thought we would do well with finding another partner, borough partner. So far we are satisfied with the way in which we have co cooperated and co Croydon has cooperated with, with us. The allegations he talks about, I have no idea about, but in fact, if he thinks they're of some merit, then perhaps he should write to Councillor Fisher. Supplementary, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before I ask you, Councillor Morritt, um, could I just remind you, uh, I did ask for brief questions. Uh, Councillor Morritt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, does the leader agree that against the need to make economies, the local Labour group pays little more than lip service in one of two ways whilst opposing these measures? Firstly, it either opposes them outright, but it at least has the benefit of a degree of consistency, or as is the case in an increasing number of papers, it shows a degree of tactical and perhaps moral cowardice and merely abstains on our proposals. Either way, in doing so, they show they're not fit to take the tough decisions necessary to lead this council through difficult time. Well, Councillor Morritt is right, and, 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 and the truth is that people of Wandsworth know he is right, because, because of that, they have been in opposition for so long. I did ask earlier one of the officers to go through the list of uh, savings we have made since the start of this administration, and I was supplied with a list uh, saying there were about £17 million worth of savings we made on which the Labour Party voted against, and £3.5 million worth of savings on which they abstained. There was no occasion on which they voted for anything, and yet they do talk about uh, their, commitment to, their commitment to help the Council find uh, ways of balancing our budget. So I, I share entirely Councillor Moritz's incredulity. Question two, Councillor Osborne. Question number two to the leader, please. 
I thank um, Councillor Osborne for his question. And uh, one thing I'd add to the written question is that uh, uh, very, very uh, uh, late this morning, we received a proposal from Kids Company, which, uh, as we have promised, we would want to look at and give it due consideration. One of the issues that does um, ri arise is whether Kids Company, in their terms of their, their constitution or in their uh, uh, governing documents, have the capacity to bid and deliver the service. But obviously, that's a matter uh, that uh, obviously lawyers on both sides will have to tease out. But it's a proposal which will be given due consideration. Supplementary. Councillor I did it first. Unusually, I wasn't waiting for you to ask. The, um, can I ask the leader then, um, as a result of uh, this proposal to which he refers, does the proposal include running the whole adventure playground? Uh, and if that's not the case, will the leader give an undertaking that should any other office come in, uh, then the door will rem remain open to other not-for-profit organisations? It's an interesting supplementary councillor. Osborne obviously has second-guessed our procurement process because what the kids' company proposal shows is that there is sufficient interest out there for a non-statutory provider of these services. And if kids' company proposal is good and proper, then it's quite right that we would want to consider competitive bids to check, test out their ability to deliver at best value consideration. Second supplement. Councillor Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, obviously, it's good news that the proposals as they stand see an investment in the equipment of Battersea Adventure Playground. Um, but as well as the proposals, as Councillor Osborne has also asked, about from a high-profile organisation such as Kids Company, which incidentally is doing great work in some of our schools already in the borough, um, will other organisations, and um, I would like to extend that beyond just not-for-profit, as there are other sorts of organisations now out there which may be able to provide services for the use of the buildings associated with the playground. Again, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Councillor Dawson's uh, supplementary, because there are other boroughs where voluntary sector and other bodies have uh, stepped up to provide services. Just, just a, a list that I looked at earlier. Um, in Ealing, a voluntary sector runs an adventure playground. But what this shows is that the services that are valued and appreciated by people don't necessarily always have to be provided by the local authority. There are other bodies who can just as easily provide the services. And the process that we have opened up effectively here, and the kids' company's bid is part of that, shows that innovative ways are there out there. It's a question of time to get them through. Councillor Miss Nichols. Question three to the leader. I, I, I thank um, Councillor Nichols for her supplementary. Um, she and I and uh, Councillor Carpenter and, and yourself, Mr. Mayor, have spent some considerable time in Roehampton over the last three weeks uh, and had a number of meetings with the local residents. Um, I am clearly of the view that whilst these meetings were well attended and there were good engagements, um, there was some meeting of mind as well, that we need to do more to find other uh, opinions so that we have got a full breadth of opinions before we come to a view on that. I have to say that uh, the meetings have been amusing at times when uh, we have weird from the broad vision uh, and the big question to talking about uh, the, the effect of sunlit uh, blocks on the morale of people whilst the people living inside those blocks often complain about uh, uh, the awfulness of those blocks. But we will come to a big picture. I am committed to listening more further and engaging further with residents in Rahampton. Supplementary? Councillor Miss Nichols. Thank you. Um, thank, um, can I thank the leader for his answer? Um, how, first of all, how, how best can, do you think that we can first encourage the residents to participate in this uh, exercise of consultation and what are the next plans uh, for this? Well, thank you Councillor Nichols for our supplement. I mean this is just really after last night's session that I felt uh, we ought to do more. 
There has been other ways in which we have reached out to people in Roehampton because there are a significant number of uh, registered residents associations who are very active with whom we have already discussed these proposals and their feedback will be coming through. There were individuals at our meetings uh, who were uh, in very encouraging and very supportive of Council's intentions and have asked of how they can help to, help to spread the message. Uh, we want to tap on that, uh, that goodwill as well as find other ways. In, in other places we have uh, thought of doing some telephone canvassing. Uh, perhaps that may be an answer here. But the, as yet I don't have specific plans which are sort of talked about just very late yesterday. Uh, we will come up with something that has wider uh, appreciation in Roehampton and perhaps get wider feedback. True. Councillor Osborne. Uh, yes, thank you. Can I ask the leader to just clarify what I think is perhaps a misunderstanding. Initial reports in the press uh, about this project, which we wholeheartedly support, uh, dealt with some very specific proposals in Danbury Avenue area, which didn't quite square with the point made by the leader that uh, we have no preconceived ideas. Uh, can you confirm for us this evening that this is the basis, this is all based on a misunderstanding and that actually uh, there is a, a full consultation process in the offing for this project? Thank Councillor Osborne for his supplementary. Most of the colleagues on my side know when not to believe the ones of the Guardian and perhaps you need to talk to us about, about why, how we know when not to believe it. Councillor Daly. Question four to the leader. Thank um, Councillor Daly for his question. There is a fairly lengthy list of information he's asked for and it's there. But one thing that um, I think Councillor Daly would be helped if I actually specifically read out because it seems that he has a misunderstanding of what the proposal in paper 12437 is. And if I read out the first bit of uh, uh, answer to the second limb of his question. Firstly, it's important to correct Councillor Daly by informing him that the Council is not proposing to decommissioning the school crossing patrol service. It is clear from paper 12437 uh, considered at the committee last week that the proposal is to provide school crossing patrol service for those schools or other stakeholders that indicate a willingness to establish funding for the service. The council will retain and fund management role for school crossing patrol service. The outcome of the consultation with school and stakeholders would determine the number of school crossing patrol sites to be retained and that is scheduled, this is scheduled to be reported back to committee. It's important that, that, that uh, the opposition understand that. The second point I'd like to make is that on the whole issue of school safety and road safety generally, this council has made spectacular progress in reducing road accidents over the years. They're not specifically linked necessarily with schools, but our schools crossing sa safety, safer routes to school has been an enormous success, and accident rate across the borough has consistently fallen. Schools themselves have a role in, 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 in addressing the road safety, both of their pupils and probably through organizing walking crocodiles and so on. And in the whole school crossing patrol discussion, there are valid questions to be asked and I know people on the opposite side do share as to why is it that we continue to provide a school crossing patrol service for four secondary schools. I mean, it does seem to be a bit too much of a service for those schools where kids are fairly free and don't necessarily need the service. Supplementary, Mr. Councillor Daly. Um, I thank the leader for his response. Um, I think he's splitting hairs a little bit by saying that this paper uh, isn't going to decommission the service because it's going to retain and fund the management role. Uh, if there aren't any school co crossing patrols, then the council won't be funding or managing them. Uh, and that is the likely outcome of this paper. Um, and it sounds like we're not too far apart, but the question I want to ask is, you say here that you are going to engage with schools now to try and retain school crossing patrols. What you fail to mention is this paper says that funding will be cut off no later than January 2013. That's less than six months. So you've committed to the cuts, but you haven't committed to securing these school crossing patrols. Would you be willing to, tonight, agree to the council that you will not commit to any funding cuts until you're absolutely sure that there are replacement services in place? Well, I think I sort of, Councillor Daly um, reminds me of what I said in response to the first question, 
there is a kind of ostrich-like attitude across that the enormity of the financial challenge facing the council, they share that enormity. The solutions we advanced to meeting that, uh, well, let's uh, delay, let's think about it, uh, and in an ostrich-like way saying that if they do that long enough, it'll go away. These are serious challenges we do need to face. Between now and January 14, I know the Councillor King is committed to making sure there is full and proper dialogue with the schools. There is plenty of time to come to that view, and if there is a solution, I am sure he will strive to get one. Councillor Locker. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, as is touched on in uh, Councillor Daly's question, on the subject of additional speed restrictions, um, I wonder if the leader would agree with me that members will want to review the outcome of the 20 mile per hour trial that we're currently running in Putney. It may well be sensible uh, in some residential areas for ward councillors to check with public opinion uh, to see if such measures should be adopted more widely, not just around schools. Um, I am of course conscious that uh, pupils may have crossed a number of roads before they get opposite the school gates. Thank you. Uh, I thank Councillor Locker for his supplementary. He makes an absolutely excellent point because the school crossing patrol usually is just outside the school and yet he's absolutely right the children will have walked some distance and crossed several roads and usually safely before they arrive at school and suddenly there's a perception that the danger uh, appears at the school uh, doors. Could I just interrupt you there leader? Could we allow the leader to finish his answer please before you interject? Well I, I couldn't hear the leader just then Councillor Belton. You must have a forceful voice, sir. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I don't want to play a former professor, late Professor Pritchard's trick of reading the answer out again, but uh, I think you get the gist. I think Councillor Locke is right to, to, to say that uh, we should, in fact, look at a wider area around the school so that the, the, the safety of all road users is, is created and then the, the school children feel much more safe to cross roads, not on their, just on their way to school, but in their normal life. After all, you know, children have school life outside school and they do cross roads and there isn't a school crossing patrol. So overall safety all the time is an important uh, consideration for us to aim for. Councillor Musnadeli. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Question number five to the leader. I, I rather like this question because uh, I, I'd say that I enjoy an excellent relationship with Councillor Reid. Um, um, we jointly chair the strategy board. We have just recently swapped roles. Uh, we give joint interviews, we talk, we uh, lunch each other, and, and we, we share the single most important ambition to create, get transformational change in both boroughs. And it is very important that we are on the same page, and it is very heartening that Councillor Reid has, has delivered uh, uh, both his vision, our vision, and, and we share the outcomes that we all want for, from it. I'm uh, being sort of fulsome in my praise of uh, Councillor Reid. I hope I haven't damaged his political chances, uh, but uh, if I have, then I'll be very sorry. Councillor Thomas. Councillor Six. Uh, <laughs> Question Six to the leader. Well, that's a, this is an um, interesting question. I, I, I wonder whether I should sort of uh, turn it round and, and ask uh, Councillor Thomas and, and those on his side uh, responsible for this to tell us what the uh, benefit to this council and the ratepayers this borough get from the three special responsibility allowances uh, given to members opposite. Uh, perhaps they could tell us what they do in, in advancing the cause uh, that we are all here for. And perhaps he could answer what his understanding is of the roles of the deputy chairman. Because I think there is a fallacy in his assumption that all the deputy chairman, or for that matter chairman, do is chair meetings. No, they do a lot more than that. They have a much, much wider role. And he will know 
that, uh, for example, the Deputy Chairman on Housing um, have regular walkabouts. They, they engage with ward re uh, re residents associations in the patches they, they, they cover. And they also join with the Cabinet Member and the Chairman of the Committee in making some critical decisions, both on service delivery and, and, and so on. So I think here's misunderstanding of the role of special responsibility allowances and the role that Chairman and Deputy Chairman play in the life of this Council. Indeed, Mr. Uh, Council Thomas. <laughs> and can the uh, leader tell me, whether, is he seriously saying that the uh, duties of uh, deputy chairs are so, such an onerous uh, burden uh, that they have to be compelled uh, to do it by giving them additional uh, money for, uh, from, from the taxpayer? Payer? Or is this indeed just a way of uh, keeping his fractious uh, troops in, in order? But more, importing, more importantly, in these, in these difficult times, Perhaps he can tell us what he thinks uh, this says to the public about his priorities when he stands there and uh, defends uh, spending more than £30,000 uh, on uh, these allowances for deputy chairs, uh, but at the same time is arguing uh, to withdraw money from school crossing patrols. This is um, classic uh, Labour Party tactic. I mean, until this uh, came on the agenda, the usual refrain was to cut senior officers' pay. And I worked out that every time they uttered it, and if the officers took a pay cut, they would now be paying us to work for the council. Um, this is a kind of lopsided way of looking at the enormity of the financial challenges we face. Then, Council Thomas, perhaps you could uh, reflect on this. Your deputy leader um, obviously deserves the stipend she gets, and I'm sure she works greatly and hard at it. But one thing that uh, I found out looking through the papers that went to the Big Society Fund application was that she blithely signed off an application for £14.67 to say that it was worthy of going forward for consideration of a grant. The processing cost of a £14.67 application far outweighed the sum sought and there was no advice, no guidance given. Now, if that is the, the responsibility that they've discharged by claiming allowances, I can tell you my colleagues do damn sight better. Thank you. The, the time for questions to the leader is now over.